You betray the law, and they'll still be. In late 1981, writers Edward Neumeyer and Michael Miner started work on a script for a film that would eventually become Robocop. The inspiration, supposedly, had come from an occasion in which Neumeyer had been out with a friend and seen a poster for the then recently released Blade Runner. When Neumeyer asked his friend what it was about, he was told it was about a cop hunting robots. This gave Neumeyer the idea for a film about a cop being a robot. He would work with Miner on this idea for several years, incorporating concepts from Miner's previous project about a mortally wounded police officer being given a cybernetic body. And, after a lucky encounter involving them being stuck in the same airport terminal as a group of Hollywood executives, the film was eventually greenlit. Then up-and-coming Dutch filmmaker Paul Verhoeven was one of the directors handed the idea, which he recalls reading about with disgust, before throwing the script in the bin. Eventually, he was convinced by his wife that there might be something worthwhile in the idea, and indeed there was. With its eventual 1987 release, Robocop was an instant cult hit, a film that mixed action spectacle with a surprisingly nuanced message about private interests and the increasing militarization of the American police force. I think it's pretty easy to read the film as a kind of Frankenstein story of its day. A story in which the bodies of the dead are chopped up and brought to life as a kind of twisted reflection of prevailing attitudes in society at the time. It's literally the story of private corporations trying to make a quick buck by fueling the fear and cynicism of what is slowly becoming an authoritarian police state. Not the hardest thing to imagine coming out of the USA in the 1980s. So there it was, a damning critique of US domestic policy wrapped up in a horror story about a man's twisted remains being turned into a violent tool of the state. A year later, Orion Pictures partnered with Marvel Productions to release Robocop, the animated series a kid's show about the continued adventures of Robocop and his partner, Officer Lewis. Given the original film's hard R rating, certain concessions were made. Now the corporation Robocop works for is more naive and incompetent than genuinely malevolent, the setting is more high fantasy sci-fi than grim reflection of our own world, and Robocop himself doesn't kill people and gets to live a relatively normal life, going out on dates and being a generally beloved member of the community. Over the course of 12 episodes, they cover topics like environmentalism, class divide, fake news, and even in one memorable episode, racism. In this episode, Robocop is set up by a gang of hooded thugs known as the Brotherhood, whose aim is to make sentient machines like Robocop look bad, because they're racist against robots. Robocop, once the unquestioned hero of his city, is unfairly framed as a monster. And then this happens. Hey, Robocop! Catch! Warning! Danger! Hey, my ball! He shot my ball! I am sorry, but I... Dad! He's after me! Keep away from my boy! Isn't enough you shot his toy? Afraid of a kid's ball, Mr. Big Shot? It was a mistake. Yeah, well, just keep away from us, you abomination. You're worse than a robot. You're some kind of a crazy freak. He's going down with Robocop! Come on, Murphy. We better leave before things get ugly. It already is ugly. Because hate is ugly. So somehow this story manages to evolve from Robocop, the robot cop, to Robocop, the symbol of everything wrong with the American police state and its corrupt corporate connections, to Robocop, the friendly neighborhood super cop, unfairly judged because of anti-robot bigotry. And from all of this, I feel like I have one question. How the f did we get here? Now a word from our sponsors. Hey, been admiring my facial hair, eh? Well, don't worry. You can have a great beard just like mine by signing up today to Harry's. This video's sponsor. If you're someone like me, there's a good chance you are A, extremely stingy and tend to buy those cheap razors you end up regretting, and or B, just 
don't like going outside. Luckily, six years ago, Harry's founders Jeff and Andy realised there were people like us out there, and started a company offering some great shaving products at a really affordable price. Harry's was even nice enough to send us over a sample pack to take a look at. We have here a particularly sharp looking razor with a fetching orange handle, and a shave gel that promises to provide cushion and glide for a smooth shave. It's a perfect little starter kit, and it even comes with a nice note. Harry's is currently running a deal to send out trial sets for the low low price of $3, if you check out my exclusive offer code listed down below. Doing so helps out the channel and gives you a chance to try out a product you might be a fan of, so give it a shot. Also, please don't forget to like the video and give it a share if you enjoy. Let's -a go! Well howdy there, pardner. Don't be afeard, it's me, Sheriff Jack Saint, here again to bend your elbow and talk with you all about the depiction of law enforcement in film, TV and other media. If you were here last time, you'll know that we've already delved into the Hootenanny, that is the development of the cop archetype as we understand it in fiction, from quaint small town deputies of the 60s to the decidedly more shady and ruthless maverick cops of the 70s and 80s. If you're a greenhorn to the channel, why don't you go lasso up the first part of this series with the link in the corner there. Which should give you a mighty good sense of what we're discussing today. Long story short, Last time we put some close study into the highly influential character of Dirty Harry, and how he represents a kind of recuperation of extreme authoritarian beliefs of law enforcement. A version of the rogue maverick cop who can do things like torture suspects, repeatedly endanger the lives of civilians, and cover up murders he agrees with, without any of the inevitable downsides that makes things like that bad. We even reckoned this pattern could extend to a lot of cop media, with further attempts to gussy up ruthless and bloodthirsty law enforcement as not just acceptable, but necessary. But then we came to ask a real bronco buster of a question. By hook or crook, what happens when it's explicit critique of this brand of law enforcement that gets recuperated like this? What happens when criticism of pop culture becomes pop culture? Well, I know a couple of cowpokes right perfect for us to take a gander at. I've also officially used up all the cowboy lingo I know, so this bit is officially unsustainable. I'm just gonna take this off, sorry. In October 1976, John Wagner released the first issue of his short-lived comic series One-Eyed Jack, a send-up of the Dirty Harry film series that towed the line between loving homage and absolute piss-take. The strip, which featured occasionally in the British anthology comic Valiant, would mostly centre around the character of gritty New York detective Jack McBain. I don't actually know if that's why the Simpsons character was called that, but um, it makes me happier to assume it is. I don't want to hear it, McBain. That, that tenant of yours is against regulations. In this department, we go by the book. By book. Though Wagner himself was born in the US before moving to Scotland as a young teen, Jack was a perfect representation of the American cop archetype as seen from a non-American perspective, an unpredictable and frankly dangerous man seemingly living in something less like a modern city and more like a post-apocalyptic nightmare world, regularly performing absurd feats of athleticism and violence in his dogged obsession with stopping the deranged killers that pushed the strip along. Jack quickly became Valiant's most popular character, something pinned equal parts on the vivid artwork of collaborator John Cooper 
and the release of the comic at a time when gritty modern realism was very much in fashion. So when Valiant went under, primarily due to the recession at the time, 7P, are you mad? Wagner decided for the newly released 2000 AD that they'd need to push things up a notch, to push the absurdly grim and bloody worlds of Dirty Harry and One-Eyed Jack to their logical conclusion. And so we got... Judge Dredd is the story of shit getting all fucked up. Shown primarily through the perspective of gruff law enforcer Joe Dredd, it tells the tale of a post-apocalyptic world where, in the wake of nuclear war, society has turned to a series of totalitarian police states in the hopes of restoring order. These states, known as megacities, are massive urban centres controlled primarily by a group known as the Judges who act as judge, jury, and executioner for the ever-growing criminal population. And I mean that fully literally. The court system in this world is flimsy at best, and most of the time judges have free reign to decide for themselves how to handle a suspect. Often even minor offenders are sentenced to decades of imprisonment, and of course any real attempt to resist arrest usually results in a death sentence. Like blowing your fucking head up! Even with just its first extended storyline, I feel like you can get an immediate sense of the kinds of questions Judge Dredd poses. That one's called The Robot War. It's about... A robot war. Specifically, the robots of Dredd's Megacity 1 becoming sick of being treated as disposable possessions of their human owners, wanting instead to be seen as sentient life deserving of respect as their own social class. This is not how Street Judge Dredd himself interprets their protests. Instead, he declares that this is a predictable result of giving the robots more and more human traits. In his own words, developing that other human trait, evil. Dredd takes the more cynical view that this is simply about robots becoming greedy and vengeful, just like humans, because these are fundamental human qualities. And so the solution, in the end, is not to grant the robots their freedom, but simply to kill their leader and reprogram them to be less rebellious. It's hard to be surprised, based on his worldview, that Dredd is generally regarded as one of the most proficient judges in Mega City 1. Because who better to keep order in a society that cares only about punishment and not at all about rehabilitation, than someone who fundamentally believes the human race can't be kept in line any other way. So when an ex-slave ally of Dredd's informs him that he hopes to stay far away from the human race, claiming they cannot help their innate selfishness and greed, Dredd replies that that's a pretty harsh assessment, but, as history has shown, a correct one. As a comic series, Judge Dredd is an absolutely fascinating study of the mindsets that spur on authoritarian ideology, and how even in its most extreme and overt forms, fascist states governed by unquestionable authority can be made to seem acceptable. You really do root for Dredd in a lot of these stories, though that's not to say the comics shy away from being more overtly critical of these systems. Most obviously, stories like America give us the rare perspective of characters other than Judge Dredd. In this case, a series of vignettes highlighting the downtrodden population of Mega City 1 and their struggles to make sense of a nation that extols the virtues of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, while, as one character points out, ending up with one out of three. And even much earlier came one of the most famous storylines, The Day the Law Died, in which Dredd is framed for murder and his superior killed, in a domino effect that would eventually lead to one particularly unhinged judge gaining control of Mega City 1. The new chief judge, Cal, is far harsher than the previous, re-establishing the death penalty and giving extremely punishing sentences for increasingly minor offences. When Dredd has had enough, his response is to incite a city-wide riot against this new ruler, claiming, in his own words, You all know my views on law and order, but today I take a drastic step. Judge Cal is insane. His law is the law of a murderer. And as you can imagine, this rebellion winds up being successful. Cal gets toppled, order is re-established. But it's hard not to feel, as with a lot of Dread stories, that the victory here is somewhat hollow. While Cal is gone, the system which puts him in place is very much still intact. 
a system in which judges have an absurd level of unquestioned power over the civilian population, can rewrite laws on a whim, and where it's difficult to disrupt even the most blatant abuses of power if said power comes from up high on the chain of command. The motif of short-term solutions to cover up much greater problems in Dread society is something we see a lot, here included in the most literal way possible, with an extended part of the story taking place in a highly polluted city river that becomes so radiated the judges just paved over it and left it to fester. And I mean, not to get all both sidesy with this conflict, because Cal is obviously worse, but Dredd's actions here really run counter to a lot of his own fundamental beliefs. He and those who follow him just decide that this particular regime change is just a step too far, and declare that the only way to stop it is to dethrone Cal from his position of power and kill him and those loyal to him outright. It opens a question of whether Dredd really believes so firmly in the law, if he's so willing to bend or outright dismiss the law when he decides it's wrong. And at that point, can we really continue to go along with the totalitarian regime of the judges? How can we continue to deny real democracy to the people if we agree that some laws just aren't fair, some leaders just don't deserve their position, and at that point all bets are off to take them down? It's another instance of the comics highlighting the flimsy and often arbitrary nature of authoritarianism. Now, the comic at this point has decades of material to cover and in a rare treat actually gets more and more interesting as it goes along, but unless you really want me to do a companion video where I just talk about the comics... I guess it's time to talk about Judge Dredd's big budget Hollywood splash that sent our humble cop hurtling into the mainstream. Yeah, that's right. The one that starred Rob Schneider. Now look, the failures of Dread 1995 definitely go a bit deeper than usually get cited by most critics. Yes, Rob Schneider takes up a significant chunk of the film with slapstick comedy. Yes, Sylvester Stallone's Judge Dread is absurdly overacted. And yes, he does take the helmet off. At least the outfit looks good. Thanks Gianni Versace. But I think what makes this adaptation so fascinating is how it seems to borrow a lot of ideas directly from the comics, while always missing the mark just like a little bit. The plot itself is based heavily on the one I just mentioned, with Dredd being framed for murder and forced to work outside the law to take down Rico, the stand-in for Chief Judge Cal, who similarly plots to usurp the authority of the judges for his own ends. What's interesting here is Rico had his own story in the comics, which the film also somewhat borrows from, maintaining his history as the genetic twin of Dredd who turned to a life of crime in opposition to Dredd's devotion to the law. Except, in the case of the comics, Rico made this turn because he really believed that working outside the law made as much sense as working within it, as the system itself was so inherently corrupt, cruel, and often arbitrary that it made little difference either way. The movies decided to interpret this as Rico getting the bad genes, and oop, now he doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. In this way, the movie winds up inadvertently using Rico to make the exact opposite point to that of the comics. Where before it was stressed that they were genetically identical and yet split paths due to a fundamental difference in ideology, in the movies his lack of faith in the law is pinned on basic genetic weakness. That experiment, something went wrong genetically mutated to the perfect criminal. Wow, I can't believe it's eugenics. Now, as people who watch my channel hopefully know by now, I don't think a change from source material is any kind of inherent flaw in a work. You can reinterpret ideas if you want, depending on the story you want to tell. But it's hard not to see the clash in a story so deeply rooted in questions of so deeply rooted in questions of how much stake we should put in authority figures and the often oppressive laws they represent, and a story about a good boy who has to beat up a bad boy because the bad boy just loves killing. Which brings us to everyone's favourite Hollywood bad boy, Rob Schneider. <laughs> this guy, 
It's funny. It's fun. So continuing the pattern of this movie trying to draw from tons of different ideas introduced in the comics, Fergie comes to represent the occasional sympathetic civilian perspectives I've mentioned, an affable ex-con who winds up on the wrong side of Dread for all the wrong reasons. He's introduced being sentenced to five years imprisonment by Dread for his own entrapment, having been forced into a gang war by his gun-toting neighbours. When Fergie points out he literally had no choice between that and suicide, Dread responds, suicide. Maybe, but it's legal. And from this interaction, we get the kind of lingering questions you'd expect to see take center stage. Are people like Fergie at fault for their own inescapable material conditions? If they aren't, should the system be changed to accommodate for them? The film goes about answering this question by... making Fergie a comic relief sidekick for the rest of the film, then having Dredd quickly discard him as he's carted off screen. Excuse me. At every turn, the film seems hesitant to commit to any of the notions it picks up from its source, and really what we end up with is like a series of amateur covers of a band's greatest hits. Crime and law are two sides of the same coin. People are the result of their environments. Unquestioned authority sets a dangerous precedent for society. 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 All of this boiled down to a very simple good guy beats bad guy narrative all of the aesthetics of Dread, but none of the follow-through on really exploring any of the ideas of the comics. Now, I do think it's worth recognising that, as a medium, movies do face a unique challenge in confronting these sorts of complicated moral quandaries. They are, for the most part, one-and-done deals, unless you're lucky enough to get a sequel, or extremely lucky enough to get a full-on franchise. If I were to take just that first Judge Dredd storyline from the comic books, it would honestly not be tough to read it as an outright fascist text, one that puts authoritarian dictators in the sympathetic perspective against a demonised, subjugated minority. Luckily, comic book writers have the advantage of putting out a story, reading up responses, then putting out new stories reacting to those responses. Movies generally don't get that luxury, and so either massively boil down the questions of the material, or resign themselves to incomplete messaging that can often point in some uneasy directions. It's worth noting that, as it's written, Dread 95 starts us with the idea that violent crime in Mega City 1 is growing rapidly, and this is what instigates the power grab by an even more extreme authority than the current judges. The movie doesn't propose an alternative to that. The bad guy kills the chief judges, then Dredd kills the bad guy, and when everything is over, Dredd simply returns to his position as street judge. It's as if all of this was a random fluke, and nothing to do with any of the issues with the system itself. But what happens now? How does this solve any of the problems the movie has presented to us? Couldn't a guy just as bad as Rico now theoretically fill that power vacuum? What of the Schneid and Schneids like him? In this framing as a celebratory moment for a job well done, the movie tries to convince us not only that we're back to the status quo, but that this status quo can be assumed to be good. And when that status quo is a draconian police state lording over an increasingly embittered and hopeless populace, it's a particularly uncomfortable narrative gap. Assuming, you know, the film isn't trying to point us towards fascism. In case you don't want to watch it, this is the best part of the film, by the way. It's state of the art. Are you saying this isn't real? Yeah. Look, I'll drop out all the artificial pixels. Dad. Mom. The only thing that's real is the baby. But the thing is, by talking about Judge Dredd 1995, I'm kind of skipping a step here, because there was another movie adaptation of Judge Dredd before this one. Not a direct adaptation, but one that deals with a lot of the same concepts, and also leads into what I've talked about so far. So let's talk about 
I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about the similarities between Robocop and Judge Dredd, something Paul Verhoeven has readily admitted since the film's release. It's a sci-fi social commentary lampooning the growing totalitarianism of the USA. It stars a cold but sympathetic cop who's willing to go above and beyond in the name of the law. The hero is pit against equal measures sadistic criminals and corrupt authorities, and they both got such cool hats. But what's so interesting about Robocop, as a parallel to the Judge Dredd Stallone film, is that they both feel heavily rooted in that Judge Dredd comic, but in almost polar opposite ways. Dredd 95 takes much of the iconography of Judge Dredd, the aesthetic, and borrows directly from many of the stories, but as I've mentioned, feels as if it intentionally blunts its more overt political messaging to fit within a standard hero-villain narrative. And while Robocop lacks any of that iconography or those stories, and is also mostly a standard hero-villain narrative, what it doesn't lack is clear political punch. You crossed my line of death! You haven't dismantled your MX stockpile. Pakistan is threatening my border! That's it, Buster. No more military aid! Nuke em. Get them before they get you. So you probably know the story by now. Alex Murphy is a city cop in a crime-infested near-future Detroit, gets gunned down by terrorists, has what remains of his body experimented on to turn into a flashy new super cop, and becomes Robocop. At which point he becomes a beloved member of the local community, before regaining some of his memories and chasing down those who killed him in the first place. In amongst all this, he gets wrapped up in a conspiracy involving his corporate manufacturers, OCP, and takes down the corrupt senior vice president, Dick Jones. Our hero stands proud after sending the corrupt exec to his death, and after a film of being referenced only as Robocop, we hear him declare his name... Murphy. So, like Dread, Robocop works fairly straightforwardly on two levels. On one level, as identified by writer Ed Neumeyer in interviews, it's a power fantasy. Something I discussed in our last video was that the 70s and 80s marked a great rise in criminal scaremongering in much of the USA, with figures like Nixon and later Reagan feeding a narrative that the nation was being swept by hordes of soulless, bloodthirsty thugs. This was a great way to justify an increase in authoritarian policies, and would eventually lead to the increased militarization of the police force and much harsher policing of local communities. And eventually, would lead directly to the skyrocketing prison populations the US is still desperately trying to recover from. So, as you can imagine, in the heat of this fear-mongering, the idea of a bulletproof knight in shining armor coming into town and gunning down these apparent shady hordes of heartless thugs had a particular appeal at the time. And so it did, becoming an instant hit and spawning sequels, spin-offs, and merchandise galore. Look to him, try the chicken. Not the hell fry the chicken. The second level to Robocop is a direct critique of the first. A critique of not only the ways corporations exploit the fear and panic of a population for their own enterprising ends, but how easy it is to do so with the right brand image and a shiny coat of paint. This is seen most obviously in the plight of Murphy himself, if the hero we see for most of the film can really be called Murphy. The question of if Robocop is just a product to be sold, or if he really is still human deep down, is one that lingers through much of the film, emphasised by OCP and Team Project lead Bob Morton's insistence that he decidedly is question. not. I asked him his name, he didn't know. Oh great. Let me make it real clear for you. He doesn't have a name, he's got a program. He's product. Is that clear? Yet despite the seedy nature of the experimentation on Murphy, and the psychological torment he goes through for much of the film, still he is framed by news media as a fun novelty, a comfort for kids and families alike. Stay out of trouble. There is a dissonance here, a feeling of manufactured authenticity that runs all through the film. To rifle off a few more, we have the ways the monstrous antagonists of the film feign civility even with full intent to butcher one another, 
as much on the outright criminal side as on the sniveling businessman working at OCP. In fact, the inciting incident that sets off the third act conflict is when these two businessmen drop their faces, and with it the false pretense of civility behind their corporate competition. When Murphy is introduced, we see him practicing spinning his gun, one of the trademarks of his character, and when asked why he does so by Lewis, telling her that it's a calling card of the lead cop in a show his son loves, DJ Laser. Murphy adopts the trait because he wants to communicate to his son that he is also a good cop. But we know that this is pure performance. Whether or not Murphy spins his guns after taking down a criminal has no bearing on whether he's good or bad. Or does it? How large a role do these little performances play in what we find acceptable and unacceptable? As a stark contrast to Judge Dredd, which is very overt about the nature of its grim regime, Robocop is all about covert concealment, both by the characters themselves and as a film. Yes, it's a story about a robot cop, but it's also one about what can be hidden behind such an idea. And then... So, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. I'm going to make the point that, much like with Judge Dredd, the Robocop franchise follows the pattern of having its more nuanced political commentary slowly shaved away, until it was nothing but the throwaway consumable that Robocop himself is framed as to the public in that first film. Like with Dirty Harry, it's another subtle form of recuperation, the dilution of radical political messaging into its most socially conventional state. And... Yep, that's definitely a thing. What do they call you? Murphy, is it? My friends call me Murphy. You call me Robocop. If there's one point that seems to be fundamentally ignored in almost every single piece of Robocop media past the first movie, it's this. The existence of Robocop is not a good thing. Alex Murphy's story is a tragedy. A man murdered only to have his corpse propped up as a flashy marketing gimmick for what is basically a human-shaped tank patrolling urban Detroit. Now, this shouldn't be confused with Robocop himself not being good. The entire purpose of Robocop is that he's an affable supercop who you can easily root for. He's the kind of weapon of mass destruction you could put on a cereal box. That's the point. But Robocop fundamentally sets an incredibly dangerous precedent for this society. There's a reason we don't have outright private militias patrolling most neighborhoods. And we'd hope it isn't just because they don't look like action fig- Oh shit. So the answer is yes. The later movies definitely get caught in the zeitgeist of Robocop as a presumed good for society, rather than what he really is. A haunting reminder of how authoritarian propaganda can work its way into our communities. Robocop 2 has Murphy faced with the OCP trying to replace him with a more flashy and impressive counterpart, alongside an incredibly on-the-nose parody of... political correctness. For all the shooting he does, I've never once seen him take the time to do anything nice, like um, visit an orphanage. There's a beautiful irony in the fact that a solid half of this film is dedicated to a needy, oversensitive public cruelly demanding Robocop be reprogrammed to do things like act more nicely and take place in community events and talk about environmentalism, when at the time this was released, this is what was being broadcasted on children's television. What is it? I don't know, but it's wrecking the environment. Got to stop them. The movies were mocking the idea of trying to brighten Robocop up into a family friendly image, while making a movie that was essentially evil dark recolor Robocop against shiny classic Robocop, made as a companion to the kid friendly cartoon show. They even give him a new coat of paint. Him blue now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Barely is the ethical concern of Robocop himself even readdressed, as we get lost in the weeds of increasing comic book fantasy. Little do we stop to consider the ramifications of this unstoppable machine man just wandering around in highly populated areas, even as Robocop got hacked slash went haywire is a plot point on like five separate occasions. Jeez, did Tony Stark build this guy? It's a reference to another video I made. And by the time we get Robocop free... He's just... He's just a superhero now. They completely forgot that the film had any kind of subtext around the nature of Murphy as a hero. Who wrote this movie? Oh. Now, there's every possibility that the evolution of the Robocop franchise, including its spin-offs, marks the most played straight parody of political recuperation I have ever seen. That could absolutely be the case, and it would maybe make it easier to sleep at night knowing about the existence of episodes like this. Leave it to the law to decide what is just. But even if we do assume this was just another case of radical messages being deliberately boiled down to make highly questionable and extreme politics seem innocuous, I don't know if it's fair to lump all this with the later studios not getting the first movie. To some extent, I also think it's wrong to attribute malice here, and suggest these creators were actually trying to normalise these kinds of radical ideas. And you might be thinking, if this isn't accidental, and it isn't politically motivated, how can it still be deliberate? Which brings us to... Released in 1998, American History X tells us the story of Derek, a reformed neo-Nazi who returns home from his extended stay in prison to discover his brother is on the path to being radicalised. The film is very overtly a critique of Nazism as an ideology, a story of misguided people being led down dark paths based on ignorance and bad personal experiences. Much has already been written about responses to the film, not just by the general public, but by neo-Nazis and white supremacists, many of whom see the film not for its anti-far-right message, but for its imagery, and the ways it displays a level of empathy and understanding of what leads people to these ideologies. One extremist band, Redneck28, even went as far as to produce a tribute song based on one sung by a Nazi in the film. Once again, it would be incredibly difficult to argue the film in either intention or execution had any pro-Nazi leanings. Among other things, director Tony Kay was himself Jewish. But as has been pointed out, from a certain lens this reading definitely can make sense. For the great pains the film takes to make us feel for these radicalised extremists, it pays very little attention to the experiences of the marginalised groups they target. And while there is a bitter tragedy to the end of the film, in which Derek's brother pays the price for earlier racist actions, it can also be very much read as Derek getting his comeuppance. Look. This is what happens when you give those subhumans the benefit of the doubt. So what does American History X teach us about the other movies we've looked at today? Well, for one, that it's often not enough to just pay lip service to a certain idea being wrong or flawed in some way. What is said directly between characters is only one way messages are conveyed in fiction, and an unreliable one at that. We don't usually take everything a person claims as an objective truth, so we shouldn't expect audiences to do so with fictional characters. Second, that empathy is an incredibly powerful tool in storytelling, and whatever you choose to highlight and build an emotional connection for the audience, the audience is very likely to begin to feel attached to. And finally, that when we leave any aspect of a text up to the audience to interpret, there is very well the possibility that they will see the exact opposite message to the one you intended. In the last few years, both Robocop and Dread have had their gritty film reimaginings, which makes sense in an era very intent on looking back critically on that 70s-80s period and asking what the hell happened, 
how do we manage to live among such gross authoritarian rhetoric and have it feel so normal? I don't think rehabilitation's worked in here, do you? Oh, they're just misunderstood, really. Well, as we've already discussed, this is partially a result of the fact that media offers us a unique ability to frame ideas in ways you may not realise unless you're paying very close attention. This is how a character like Dirty Harry, who openly expresses such extreme, brutal, and as we know now, fundamentally flawed ideas, can seep into the mainstream public consciousness. But you know you're an endangered species. This is the age of lapsed responsibilities and defeated justice. Today an eye for an eye means only if you're caught. And even then it's an indefinite postponement and uh, let's settle out of court. But with Judge Dredd and Robocop, we see something else. Media that is highly critical of the ideas it represents. Judge Dredd as a comic series is deeply conversational, constantly developing and elaborating on its own ideology over the years. The original Robocop is an extremely incisive piece of social commentary, and has a kind of honesty to it that made its most recent remake feel particularly lacking. This version of the film definitely borrows a lot of its critiques from the 1987 movie, but expresses a total lack of willingness to embrace the propagandistic tone of the original. The film has little to no humour, and Murphy himself is a pretty morose and not particularly likeable character. As Robocop, he mostly just seems creepy and unstable. In its effort to avoid being interpreted by the audience as advocating for these extreme ideas, the 2014 remake inadvertently fails to capture the true horror of how propaganda can effectively make the unthinkable kid-friendly. And therein lies the problem. Recuperation isn't always so overt as a Dirty Harry. It isn't always about taking an extreme idea and reducing it to something acceptable. Sometimes the recuperation itself may be what's being highlighted as a form of criticism. Sometimes the recuperation may be an incidental result of trying to fit a far more complex critique into a much simpler narrative. And sometimes the recuperation may come from the fact that art is interpretive, and in the process of adapting it, you have to decide what the art means and how you're going to communicate that. Dread 2012, which despite being easily my favourite of all these films sadly hasn't got much discussion here, is a perfect example of this. This is a film that, in contrast to the Stallone movie, feels like it has a far darker and more violent tone than even most of the comics. And you certainly could claim that it serves as a kind of recuperation, as there's very little in the way of overt criticism of Dredd's rampant murder spree and a lot of unsympathetic framing of the criminal element, meaning you could argue it delights in the authorities' butchery of these people. I saw it quite the opposite way. To me, the relentlessly dismal and gory nature of Mega City 1 and Dredd's actions made it all the more clear how horrific the world is that these ideologies point towards. In any case, Hopefully we're now starting to understand how complex this topic can get. Our stories may feed into extreme or harmful beliefs, but they can just as easily be processed that way by popular culture, even when aspects of them clearly condemn those beliefs. This is the adaptation problem, that no matter your intentions, the establishment can find ways to make it all fit within a sympathetic narrative. And that's just one reason that all cops are bad. In media. Hey folks, thanks for watching. As always, I want to thank you all for making it through the video, and I encourage you all to leave a comment with your thoughts down below. You can also get in touch with me personally on Twitter, at Lacking Saint. If you especially like the video, please consider backing me over on Patreon to help support the channel and be one of the names scrolling by now. You can also throw me a couple bucks on coffee for one-time donations. Today I'd like to give a special thanks to A Recusant, Callan Stein, Kalra Ra, Ethan, Industrial Robot, Malpatuis, Torin the Exile, with an extra special thanks to Leftist Tech Support. Also, here's the thing I want to start doing, channel recommendations. Might as well use my platform for some good, so until I figure out a cooler way to integrate this, 
please check out Curio, who some of you may remember from the NPC video I did a while back. They recently put out a video on anime and politics, it's very good. Also check out Kay and Skittles, another incredibly underrated lefty channel. They're currently doing a series analysing The Legend of Korra. On my own end, a quick reminder that I'm still doing Twitch streams over at twitch.tv slash so follow me over there. One final thank you to Harry's for sponsoring us on this video. Once again, if you sign up with the link below, you'll be helping out the channel a lot. Other than that, stay safe, love you all, and catch you next time. You punks.